Welcome to 500. The one I'm going to be talking about tonight is the introduction, and I want to cover in this class three aims. I want you to understand why the world ended up the way it actually is. Two, to, I want you to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. That's a big reason why we look at the past is so we can see what they did wrong, so we don't do the same thing. And, and I think you'll be surprised at how many mistakes they made and how big some of them were. I mean, it's really amazing historical, really, I mean, it could be like a Cinemax movie, some of this stuff. But anyhow, number three, and also to gain inspiration from heroic people who made a difference in their own time. So those are our three aims for this class. And so I've given you notes with blanks in it for you to fill in any information that I mentioned that strikes you or that you want to uh, remember. Uh, we have these movement profiles for you to fill out if, um, so, so that you can have those looking back after the class is done. And then the timeline. I'm going to be using a topical approach, so there's going to be events that are overlap. And the only way to have that perspective is if, is if you put all the, or a number of the events all in front of you on a sheet of paper. So my goal is to talk about Martin Luther. That's my goal for tonight. But I can't do that until we talk about what the world was like that Martin Luther stepped into. Okay. So after the break, we're, we'll talk about Martin Luther. But right now, I need to set the scene. So I have three points, which is setting the scene, precursors of the Reformation, and the movement known as humanism. And this is actually a positive movement, not to be confused with modern secular humanism. But this is, this is my, my outline, these three things. So the first thing is to set the scene and to talk about what the world was like 500 years ago. Because it's so, so different than our world today. Uh, so first of all, I will talk about life and death 500 years ago. They have no electricity, no running water, no indoor plumbing, no gas heat. I mean, just think about what it would be like right now without heat and electricity. How could we even do this? It would be hard, right? We'd have to have a fireplace running, and we'd have to have candles everywhere, right, or kerosene. They have no computers, no phones, no Facebook, no cars, no postal service. All right, so we're talking about a, a vastly different world and it was thinly populated. I'm speaking mostly about Western Europe right now in, in the start of this class. It's thinly populated because in the 14th century, the 14th century, just by the way, I've got this little whiteboard app thing going on here. So if I say the 14th century, then I'm talking about the years 1300 to 1399. Okay? But in the 14th century, there had been the Black Death, a plague that had swept through Europe and had killed tons and tons of people. And so by the time we get to the, the 1500s, the 16th century, Europe is, is, is growing again, but it's still thinly populated. There's a high infant mortality rate, and uh, the numbers are something like 15 to 35 uh, percent died before first birthday. And then another 10 to 20 percent uh, died before uh, 10th birthday. Okay? So massive death all around. It's, giving birth is one of the most dangerous things you could do 500 years ago. I mean, it's still fairly dangerous, but back then it was extraordinarily uh, dangerous. People are living on an agricultural um, way of, of life, it's subsistence, you know, you're, you're living from hand to mouth, you're not, you're not really getting ahead, there aren't 401ks, um, and uh, 65 to 90 percent were peasants, okay, so it depends on where we're talking about, um, peasants, farmers, okay, so the, the peasants are the ones, that's like everybody, right, and they're the ones who are working, and they're farming, and then the work they do is going to benefit some lord over them, not themselves. So they, they get a portion of it to survive, but by and large, 
they are, they are supporting the, the wealthy class. Suffering and death were pervasive. They have bad medical care, famine, epidemic disease, war breaks out all the time. The world is a totally different place than our world today. You hear what I'm saying? They lived in a highly stratified society, so that you have some that are at the very top, which would be the monarchs, the kings and the queens and the princes and the royal court. And then you have other layers of nobility beneath them, right down to the very bottom layer, which is 65 to 90 percent of the people who are actually shouldering the burden of society. And so in a town, you'd have extreme differences of wealth. You'd have some people that were fabulously wealthy, and then everybody else. And there were special garments and colors that would distinguish people as being of a certain rank, and everybody knew their place in the order of things. Uh, I'm going to mention one thing after the, the break here about the Peasants' War, which is a war that broke out in the time of Martin Luther. And it, it totally makes sense once you picture the world this way and how disgruntled you would be at the bottom of this, this situation. And you might pick up your pitchfork and say, hey, no, I'm going to fight for a more just and equitable society. And that's indeed what happened. And they were totally slaughtered by the knights because the knights had horses and armor and swords. Um, but uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves. All right, so that's life and death. That's setting the scene for the time 500 years ago. The other thing is beliefs and practices. So I want to talk about beliefs and practices. This would be good to put on the profile sheet. Okay, so if you want to flip over to that, because there's actually a box there called Beliefs and Practices for Medieval Catholicism. I didn't call the group Roman, Cath Roman Catholics or Roman Catholicism because it's too hard to define that. Like, who started the Roman Catholic Church? I looked that up on the internet today. Or I, I looked up, when did the Roman Catholic Church start today on the internet? And one person said, the year one. Another person said, no, it was the year 33, on the day of Pentecost. And then another person said, no, it was, it was 313. And then another one said, well, actually, it's not until 1054 when you have the great schism between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics. So I'm not going to get into any of that. That's not in our period. That's not for our focus. But I, I do want you to understand what most people at the time, 500 years ago, when Martin Luther came on the scene, what they believed and what they practice as far as Christianity is concerned. Okay, so I don't have a founder for you. You could just put developed there. It de who started the medieval Roman Catholic Church? It just developed out of what was already there before. As far as the, let me pull out my sheet here. As far as the current number of people that identify in the year 2014 as being Roman Catholic, we have 1,066 million. So, 1,166 million. 1,166 million. Otherwise said, 1,166 million people. So, these, this, this group is still, without question, the dominant Christian group in existence today. There are as many Catholics as there are all other kinds of Christians combined, currently. And also the same number, roughly, of Muslims. So you have the same number of Muslims and Catholics, and then all non-Catholic Christians. Uh, that makes about half the population of the world, that, those three groups. But uh, the current number is 1,166 million. I'm doing them all in millions. Okay, so let's talk about beliefs and practices of medieval Roman Catholicism, because Catholicism changes a lot over the last 500 years. But what was it like when Martin came on the scene? Number one, infant baptism. Infant baptism is an absolute required institution in their society. It is known as both a, a civil responsibility and a religious responsibility. So let's say somebody has a baby. What they do is they bring it to the local town church that they're required by law to attend, and there aren't any other alternatives around and they enter that baby into the city registry through the act of baptism. Okay? And so this, this puts a child on the grid, so to speak. Okay? Sort of like a social security card of the ancient 
world is uh, infant baptism. It's bigger, bigger of an issue than you or I would think it would be. Um, the next thing is the church. they believe the church is God's instrument of salvation on earth. That's what most people believed. Uh, the church is God's way or instrument of salvation. As far as death, is pretty much the same as today. You've got heaven, hell, and purgatory in between the two. The two things that really mattered to a Christian in 500 years ago was right belief and right behavior. Right belief and right behavior. Two, two important things. Both of these things would be told to you by the church. So the church, and, there, and there's, not, there's not a lot of questioning. I mean, sometimes you have questioning of things going on, but generally people trusted the clergy to know what they were talking about. It's just like you, you trust the dentist to know what he's talking about or the doctor or whatever, the elevator repairman. I guess they didn't have those. Um, faith is not enough for salvation. You need faith and works for salvation. Um, the church has authority that's based on uh, apostolic succession. It's kind of a, a weird word there. But apostolic su succession is the idea that Jesus laid hands on Peter, Peter laid hands on the next uh, uh, pope in the line, and so on, up until the day that they're standing there. Everyone can trace back their ordination right to Jesus. And for, and for them, that is their basis for authority. We hold the mantle of uh, Jesus Christ on earth. And so the leader, our leader, the Pope, is the representative of Christ on earth. This is the, the, uh, what people would have, what would have been non-controversial for them and what they would have believed. So you have a hierarchy. You've got the Pope. And then under the Pope, you have bishops. And under the bishops, you have priests. And that's kind of the, the system that everything works by. And then you have religious orders. Religious orders are kind of cool. You have monks and nuns. And there were two kinds of these religious orders. One was the contemplative orders, and the other were the mendicant orders. So contemplative orders are the ones who are cloistered away from society. And they're praying. And they're probably have some sort of farm or way to make money in their monastery or in their convent. And their goal is to separate from the world. And you have examples of that are like the Benedictines, the Cistercians, and, and there are many others. Then you have the mendicant orders, which are um, they're, they're the ones who are going to be living in society. And they're going to serve through teaching, through missionary work, through hearing confessions of the local town people. And so they're, they're going to be a lot more involved in people's everyday lives. And examples of them would be the Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, and so on. It's not so important to me that you, that you get every little word here so, so much as you get the gist so we can calibrate our minds to the way the world was at that time. Uh, because unless we do that, we're going to think of Martin Luther and what he did in terms of our world today. And, that's, and that's, that's not going to be helpful. So we have, to, we have to adjust our minds to their world at that time. You have, po you have a pope, you have the bishops, you have the priests, you have the monks and the nuns, you have the ones that are off in the mountains doing battle with the demons and praying and, and doing all this holy stuff that you don't know anything about. And then you've got the ones that come in and they're begging and they're asking for, for donations all the time and you're supporting them and they're coming in to preach occasionally. As far as the worship service, they called it a mass. So that's their worship service. It's called a mass. And it's a, this hasn't changed much uh, for Catholics. It's um, a sacrifice to God. Um, of the Eucharist is the word they like to use for that. Uh, Eucharist just means good grace. But... And in, in the, the way they're using it is talking about the body and blood of Christ in the, in the bread and the wine. Okay? And so for them, the, the Mass is not just a, a worship service to help people. It's actually a sacrifice where Jesus' body and blood are 
partaken of, and, and that sacrifice is done for God. They believed in a doctrine called transubstantiation. I picked a word processor that doesn't have spell correcting, so beware. Uh, transubstantiation is the, is the technical term for the idea that the bread literally changes into the physical body of Jesus when the priest blesses it. And the wine literally changes into the blood of Jesus when the priest blesses it. Now, they, they obviously knew that it didn't taste like human flesh and it didn't taste like human blood. And so they had ways of thinking about it and, and figuring it out using Aristotle's logical categories and everything else. And we're not going to get into any of that. But this becomes a major issue uh, for a lot of groups uh, later on. Although Martin Luther does believe in the real presence. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that after the break. So the priest's words, what makes a priest uh, legitimate? What makes a priest legitimate is that he can trace his ordination back to the apostles. And that's what makes him legitimate. It's not that he lives a holy life necessarily. It's not that he has a degree from some university or anything like that. What makes him legitimate is that he has been ordained by the church. He's had the anointing oil and, and, and hands placed on him, and that's what makes him legitimate. And only a legitimately ordained priest can do this transubstantiation in the weekly mass. Only a, a, a true priest would have the authority to actually, when he blesses it, it becomes the body of Christ. When he blesses it, it becomes the blood of Christ. When you bless it, it doesn't become that. You could get up there, you could wear the costume and everything else, but it's not going to do it because that's the, and, and this is just this is just their world, all right. This is just how they thought about things. So, then you have sacraments. Sacraments are physical acts that have a spiritual meaning to them, and there are seven of them. Does anyone think they can list all seven? Dad, you want to try? Oh, he's got one there. Yep. Yep. The technical term for last rice is extreme unction. Okay? So these are the seven recognized physical acts that the church performs that uh, bring about a spiritual result. And these are accepted in their society. Infant baptism, penance, which is prescribed by the priest upon uh, confession. Then you have communion, or, or what they would, might put it as Eucharist. You have com uh, confirmation, which is when you uh, grow, to grow to be of age and you can confirm that you're baptized, you now are agreeing to your baptism, that you are actually going to live it out. Matrimony is, is uh, getting married. Extreme unction is you're about to die and the, then the priest can come and bless you before you die. Um, and then you have holy orders, which is like the priests and the monks and the nuns would take those kinds of sac sacraments uh, to get things uh, cooking. All right. Just a few more things before we get to number two, which is precursors of the Reformation. Some heroes to, to look at that uh, I think will, you'll find inspiring, but at the same time, sad that they were so ineffective in, in their own time, usually getting killed. But anyhow, back to uh, beliefs and practices. We have another major aspect of the faith is pilgrimages, and uh, that often but not always relates to relics. Relics are physical remains of saints that have miracle working properties. And so if you have the bone of a saint, it will be in a shrine and probably cared for by one of the orders, one of the monasteries or one of the convents. And you can then make a pilgrimage to that site and if you are in proximity to that physical remain of that holy person, then you believe it will affect a miracle for you. 
They will do something. This is still practiced to this day. When I was in Ephesus, uh, we went to the home, the home of Mary, which, you know, even the, the guy there who ran the place is just like, we have no idea if this is really Mary's house. We just know this house is from the first century, um, which is kind of funny because you have lines of pilgrims that are putting their prayers on tissues in the wall uh, line, lining the uh, road there. But okay, so you have pilgrimages and relics. These are all things that Martin Luther is going to go bananas on. He's just going to go nuts uh, for this kind of stuff and uh, other, other people as well. But think about it. If you really believe this whole system, it makes sense. You know what I mean? With, with you, when you're inside of it and you accept it as already being true, and then you hear, oh, Midge went to... Um, you know, this, uh, this place where they had uh, the head of John the Baptist and she prayed for her sister and her sister was healed. Now, Pat hears that story and she's like, oh, you know, this, you know, may, you can see how it was spread, right? And how people would get excited about that and they would say, well, if I really got my act together, I'd go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem or I'd go on a pilgrimage to this holy uh, place or to Rome. All right, the people... Of the 16th century and, and, and prior to that, they were actually really into it. They were, vi they were vigorous, okay? Um, and the way we know this is because when the printing press comes out, the number one thing that gets printed on it is a book of hours. A book of hours is a prayer book that's used by the, the monks in the cloistered contemplative monasteries, okay? People that are waking up throughout the night to say, set prayers. And this book is an absolute bestseller as soon as the printing press comes out in the 1400s. Why? Because people, regular people, want to pray the prayers of the monks in the contemplative orders that are way out in the mountains somewhere. Because people are really into it. Um, also, they endow masses. They pay money to dedicate a mass to a dead family member or somebody that's currently alive. And a lot of money comes in through that. They pay for these urban preachers. They pay for the church upkeep. Who's paying for all the stuff? The people are. If people don't believe in it, then they're not going to contribute to it. Um, and many, many are just taking their faith really seriously. Okay? So it's not, you know, whatever, whatever our perspective might be towards medieval Catholicism is probably not the same as their perspective. Their perspective is, hey, this is the world I live in. I'm participating in it. I'm trying to do a good job. This matters to me. It's life and death. It's heaven and hell or pur purgatory. And they're, they're in this system. However, at the same time, as there are these vigorous practices, there's anti-clericalism. And I just want to write that down so you see how that's spelled. Anti-clericalism, which is an attitude against the priests, against the monks for certain things. So one of the things they really didn't like about the clergy, and you, again, you don't, you don't have these kinds of complaints unless you care. If you don't care, then who cares, right? Who's going, who's going to mention anything? But if you really do care, then, you, then you, start, you start getting upset that the clergy are exempt from, um, what, are, what are they exempt from? Taxes. They don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to pay tithes. Uh, they don't have to have a civil trial. They can have a, a church trial. So if they commit a crime, they're not held to the same standards. They, they have a different uh, trial. They don't have to do the night watch in the city, uh, which is to watch for animals, uh, bandits, or you know, an invader of some, some sort, they don't, which I'm sure wasn't a glamorous job. Uh, but they're exempt from that. Uh, they don't have to do firefighting, and they don't have to do war. So people, people didn't didn't really appreciate that about the clergy, that they're exempt from all these things that they have to do. Another thing was um, they had to pay tithes and clerical fees, and the IRS and the church were kind of combined 500 years ago. Not kind of. They were combined. They're, it wasn't called the IRS. But your taxes go to support the church. You don't have a choice about it. Um, and so people are spending a lot of money on this. Some of the clergy... Um, they get greedy, and they hold multiple church offices. And this is called the sin of simony. 
uh, because Simon Megas famously tried to buy the power to lay hands on people to receive the Spirit in the book of Acts. So people would buy church offices, and then they would, they would uh, staff that parish or diocese with a priest that they hire at a very low rate, but they would be collecting all the money. Okay? And this was starting to be, become rampant um, by the time we get to the 16th century. A, a, a number of the priests, I don't know how many, whether it was just some or if it was a lot, uh, were into immorality, uh, sexual immorality, especially with um, concubines, where they would have a live-in girlfriend who would bear children. Some of the popes even were guilty of this. Um, and so then there was one other major issue, which they call the Babylonian captivity, uh, where the popes actually left Rome and transferred the, the capital fu functioning of the church to Avignon in France. And they were, they were kind of run out of Rome and uh, had to relocate to France for some years. And there was all this controversy where we had at one time four popes all claiming to be the real pope. And then finally it was settled and then the pope was back in Rome in the Vatican where he's supposed to be. And so all these things gave, lent towards this anti-clericalism. So at the same time, you have very active Christian people. You have uh, uh, kind of a critical spirit as well because of these other things. All right, let's take a look at John Wycliffe and Jan Hus. John Wycliffe, he was born... 1330 and died 1384. I tried to put his dates in your notes. I think I did. I wouldn't put birth and death dates on the timeline, though, because it would just, it would just be too much, I think. Uh, but put a date for when something happened. So, for example, for, um, for Wycliffe, the famous thing is in 1377... Uh, he's denounced, Wycliffe is denounced by the Pope. You could put that down. Well, let me, let me just run through what I have, and you decide what you want to put down for John Wycliffe. But you definitely want to put him on there somewhere, which is why I started the timeline before the year 1500, so that I could mention John Wycliffe and John Hus, or Jan Hus is how you're supposed to say his name. He's Czech. Uh, but, okay, John Wycliffe. He is the uh, main guy who translates the Bible from the language that it was already in, Latin, into English. Now, that's not the original. The original Bible was written in what languages? Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. That's the, the original language of the Bible. The, the Bible that people had access to, especially in the 14th century, was in Latin. The church is Latin. And so he translated not from the original languages, but from Latin into English, but there's only two major problems. One is there's no printing press. It hasn't been invented yet. And two, it's very expensive because you have to actually hand write out the entire Bible, right? So you make a copy, right? And now you're going to cherish that copy. And you're not going to probably give it away to somebody or lend it out. You know, it's your, it's your copy. And it was a very wooden literal translation, not easily readable, um, basic, more of an interlinear than what we would be used to as far as a translation. Um, and, but anyhow, John Wycliffe, he was a teacher at Oxford. He was a theologian. He was a philosopher. And uh, his followers are called Lollards, which is kind of a funny word. That's Wycliffe's followers, Lollards. It's a word uh, related to the tongue sort of like tongue waggers, because his followers were preachers, and he was a preacher. And so they, the people made fun of him as being tongue waggers, lollards. And so he, he said, or it was said of him, the jewel of the clergy has become the toy of the laity. I spelled has wrong there. The jewel of the clergy has become the toy of the laity. That's what his critics said. 
because he brought the Bible into the common man's language. So they call it the jewel of the clergy is now just the toy of the laity. Of the, the laity is just a word that means the people that aren't um, priests or, or monks or whatever. So he focused on the Bible in his ministry. Uh, again, he was a university uh, trained man. Um, he was a big time anti-clericalism guy. So he's, he's pointing out the immorality of the priests. He's, he's trying to get this situation to change. Um, he does not like the Pope influencing secular power. Um, he says, in temporal things, the king is above the Pope. So as far as things of this age are concerned, the king is above the Pope. You think the king liked that? Yeah, the king liked that. The king of England, right? Uh, so John Wycliffe is I English. I think I mentioned that. And so people call Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation. What's the morning star? Well, other than a reference to Jesus, it's sort of like the very first thing you see in the morning when the sun's about to rise. Yeah. And so it's just the dawn of the Reformation. He's sort of like the Reformation before the Reformation. So anybody, anytime somebody starts talking about history starting from 500 years ago, which is the time we call the Reformation, we, usually we mention John Wycliffe because he is, he is uh, already doing a lot of the same stuff. So in 1377... Gregory II um, denounces Gregory the Eleventh denounces Wycliffe, and he excommunicates him from the church. Um, he's protected by a relative who's very powerful, and he's popular with the king because he's saying things like, you know, the king's really in charge of, you know, these sorts of things like the. The, uh, the, the military, the economy, trade, you know, these, these temporal, secular areas. The king's in charge of those, not the pope in Rome. What does this Italian have anything to do with us in England telling us what to do? So the king kind of likes Wycliffe, and uh, he, is, he is protected. And the king of England marries Anne from Bohemia. Bohemia is uh, not just a song, but Bohemia is a place that today is referred to as the Czech Republic. Okay? So the king of England marries a woman from Bohemia, and she brings his ideas there, Wycliffe's ideas, to what we call today as the Czech Republic, formerly Czechoslovakia, where this guy named John Huss gets his start. So he's 1372 to 1415, and he's even more important for us to know than John Wycliffe, although he is very critical and very exciting of a person to look at, John Huss even more so. What he does is he translates Wycliffe's writings into the Czech language. So Wycliffe is English, so he wrote in the English language. People in Bohemia can't read English. So John Huss brings that into Czech. He is the head of the University of Prague, John Huss. He's not some, you know, nobody. I mean, he is a very significant um, administrator. He's the rector of the University of Prague. He's a fiery preacher against immorality of the papacy, that's the pope, and of the clergy. So he's just like John Wycliffe. He's, he's preaching, you, you can't be, you know, we're, we're paying all our tithes to you, and what are you doing with it? You're buying other church offices and hiring little priests to do your work while you get fat on your estate and sleep with your concubines. You know what I mean? That kind of really edgy preaching John Huss is getting into, and he, uh, he, he wants to do something radical with the uh, communion. He wants to distribute the wine and the bread to the people, not just the bread. And they don't like that about him. So in 1409, he gets excommunicated by the Pope, Alexander the fifth, if you want to know which pope it was. Uh, so he gets excommunicated, which is almost like a compliment as we'll be going through this. You'll see people that get excommunicated. Uh, I'm sure there are a bunch of rascals as well, but the ones I'm focusing on get excommunicated for good reasons. Um, and so his followers are known as Hussites. <laughs> kind of a funny word. So followers of John Huss in the Czech Republic are called Hussites. And um, 
Later on, the Pope will try to conquer the Hussites, and he launches no less than five crusades against them, and the Hussites defeat the Pope's armies every time. And so John, John Huss's followers do quite well. And a century later, which is once we get into our period, 500 years ago, in the 1500s, when that time finally comes and the Reformation gets cooking, the Czech Republic just goes bananas for it. And within a century from the time of John Huss, 90% are non-Catholic in Bohemia. So it becomes a hotbed for Reformation or Protestantism um, because of the earlier work that John Huss had done in getting things uh, started there. Okay, so what happened to John Huss? Well, he didn't die of natural causes like John Wycliffe. Although Wycliffe was dug up later on, and they burned his bones and threw him in the river once they could finally get their hands on him. But he was already had died of natural causes. But anyhow, John Huss, um, they called him down to a, a conference, and the emperor guaranteed him safe passage to the, uh, the Council of Constance, is what it was called in the year 1415, which you notice is his death year. And so he made his will, John Huss, not trusting the, the Pope and the Emperor and all this is going on. He makes his will before he leaves. And when he gets there, he's condemned. And he says to them, you guarantee me safe passage. You have to let me go home. And the Emperor says, ah, but that's not, that doesn't apply to heretics, which is, of course, the only time you would actually need it. <laughs> so... And uh, he gets burned at the stake in 1415. So that's John Hus, Jan Hus. All right, number three, we look at humanism, the movement. Oh, there's John Wycliffe and John Hus. Nice picture of both of them. They were into beards. Nothing wrong with that. All right, now we get into humanism. Humanism is an academic movement. It's an academic movement. And humanism, the, the, the clarion call or cry of humanism is ad fontes, which means to the sources. It's a movement that happens in the universities that says, we need to get to the sources. We need to stop reading translations of everything and get to the original Greek. Get to the original early Latin. Get to the original Hebrew. It, it's, it's a whole movement that happens throughout universities um, called humanism. But before I really get into humanism with you, I want to talk to you about Johannes Gutenberg, who makes everything possible. He, he invents the equivalent of the Internet for 500 years ago. Okay? And what does he invent? He invents the printing press. Okay? So Johannes Gutenberg, I have him in your notes there, 1395 to 1468. In the year 1439, I'll put that up here so you have it. 1439, uh, Gutenberg invents the printing press. Okay, and so this is a way to have movable type so that you can mass produce books rather than handwriting them out or carving wood, wood cuts and then using them as stamps, which is another way they were doing it. So he initiates the printing revolution. And once you have printing capabilities, you know what you can do? You can spread ideas at a reasonable cost. Before that, you could spread ideas. If you're the king and you wanted to have so many copies of something handwritten out, you could spread ideas. But now you have a standardized type. It's easier to read. It's cheap to print. And anybody who wants to, it's decentralized. It's an invention. So you go to a printer. You hire the printer. They print your stuff. You distribute it yourself. And so he plays a key role in the Renaissance and the Reformation. And the, in the year 1455, we get the Gutenberg Bible. Um, and there, he makes 180 copies of it. 180 copies of the Bible, just like that. Right? And so, of course, this is the Latin Bible that the church would officially recognize as well. Uh, but... The Bible, think about the Bible. It's, how many pages is the Bible? It's different in all our versions because they're all using different techniques to use super thin paper and sometimes super small prints and sometimes double columns in order to squeeze it all into a, reg, a regular size looking book, right? The Bible's massive. 
And so for Gutenberg, to be able to print the Bible was sort of to say, I can print anything, right? Because if you could print the Bible, you, you, you basically got the thing figured out. I mean, it is, it is a functional system for printing all kinds of things. And so with, with, with what he brings about, I have a, a, a bar chart here. In the uh, bottom, you see the 15th century, which is when the printing press is invented, and the bar there is very, very low. By the 16th century, we're at over 200 million copies of books. So going from nothing to 200 million within a century, and then in the 17th century, we're up to over 500 million books that are printed, to the 18th century, which is up to over a billion books that are printed. I mean, this thing is a huge invention, and we all have always had it, and we never think about how much of a big deal it is because we've just always had books. But this was a massive, massive game changer, which enabled people like Desiderius Erasmus, who's our, our last point before the break, Desiderius Erasmus, to do what he did, which is to dig up old manuscripts and print them. Right? So he would find old manuscripts of the Bible, of the New Testament, and he would compare them to each other, and then he would bring that to the printer and he'd say, print this using the Greek alphabet, and suddenly you've got the Greek New Testament as a book floating around. Well, if you've got the Greek New Testament floating around, people like Martin Luther could translate it into German. People like William Tyndale could translate it into English. I mean, there's no telling what could happen, right? And not just the church's approved Latin translation with all its tweaks to make things uh, agree with what they know it is supposed to say, but the actual originals into the language of the people. So Desiderius Erasmus is a, is a, is a powerhouse figure. I was, I was looking him up on the web. I was like, man, I should, I should buy his, his complete works. You know, sometimes they have the complete works of this guy or that guy, ancient people. Sometimes they're really cheap. And so I'm looking it up, and I found, like, a few editions, and it's like, you know, so many hundred pages. And I'm like, well, how many did he really write? turns out it's 89 volumes, encyclopedia-sized volumes. If you want to actually buy the complete works of Desiderius Erasmus, and each volume is currently going for $122. So I decided not to do it. But <laughs> this is a man who wrote. He didn't have TV. There wasn't Netflix or YouTube or whatever you're into. Like, he wrote books, and he wrote letters, and he wrote letter after hundreds and hundreds of letters, and people will turn to the writings of Desiderius Erasmus to see what life was like in the 16th century, in the 15th and the 16th centuries. So he's a Christian humanist, and so his goal is to bring everyone back to the sources. And he's concerned about, you know, he's, he's kind of, he's a scholar, so he's concerned about the deteriorated state of language, of Latin that people are speaking. He's like, you know, we need to get back to the classical Latin. And he's concerned about um, going back to the original Hebrew and Greek, trying to figure out which manuscripts are best. Um, he, he, prints, he prints the Greek New Testament in 1516, uh, comes out with another edition in 1518, another edition in 1522. And then after that, it's church fathers. He starts, he starts reprinting all these ancient uh, works of Christianity. I mean, once the printing press gets invented, it just starts <coughs> producing. People are print, running stuff off left and right, especially at the university level. Rasmus is optimistic about human nature. He writes a book called The Incuridian, which is really hard to spell. In 1503, it's a handbook. Uh, there was somebody else who had written an Enchiridion. Um, I think it was Epictetus, the ancient Greek philosopher uh, from you know, the early centuries. Uh, I don't remember exactly what century, first or second century, I think. And so he's writing his own Enchiridion, his own handbook on how to live the good life, sort of a self-help book um, in 1503. And then he's, he's writing another book called In Praise of Folly in 1511 where he's, it's a satire, criticizing religious practices, making fun of priests who are being naughty, 
and just ridiculing them for their bad behavior. Because he, he, he's, he's not trying to start any kind of crazy movement. He's just trying to nudge people slowly and steadily back to the sources to a better understanding of the world, of literature, of truth. And so his, among his many other writings, he produces the Greek New Testament in the year 1516 with his own Latin translation in parallel. It's a parallel Bible. I actually have a copy. I, I should have brought it up for you. But um, it's a parallel Bible with Greek in, in one side of the page and Latin in the other side of the page. And famously, in his 1516 version, he leaves out the most Trinitarian verse in the Bible. The verse that says, there are three who bear witness in heaven. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but it's like the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three agree. And then there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are one or something like that. Uh, I should have written it down so I could quote it exactly. He leaves it out because it's not in any of his Greek manuscripts. It's not in the original. So he leaves it out. And so the church, the Catholic, medieval Roman Catholic church, goes bananas. They're just like, what are you, what are you doing? You can't get rid of the most Trinitarian verse in the Bible. Who do you think you are? And he's like, at Fontes, baby. I'm back to the sources. That's who I am. And they're like, you, but no. And, and the church burns you at the stake if you really stick your neck out, okay? And he knows that. So he says, he challenges the church's representatives. He says, look, you show me one manuscript, one Greek manuscript with this Trinitarian verse in it. I'll put it in. He's like, I believe in the Trinity. It's not a problem. I, I just want to see it in the source. And so they had some monks write a manuscript. Ink is, is still... Uh, maybe a little wet by the time it gets to Erasmus, and they say, here! He says, all right, I'll put it in. It's in the next edition, 1518, 1522. And sadly, this, you know, it works its way into the German Bible and the English Bible as a result of that until it's taken out more recently in the last century. So that's, that's a little bit of an intro to some stuff before we see Martin Luther do his thing. So um, is, are there any questions as far as the profile or... Anything else before we take a break? All right, let's take a break.